The Maria Riddle Homicide Investigation Hello. The topic is a true crime cold case murder. In fact, the coldest case ever to result in a conviction 55 years later. However, the case is not without controversy since the conviction was overturned four years later. Did the suspect simply get away with murder? Or did the police have the wrong person right from the start? In a nutshell, here are the basics of the case. Sycamore, Illinois, December 3, 1957. Maria Bridolph, a seven-year-old girl, was kidnapped from a street corner near her house. Five months later, her body was found outside of Woodbine, Illinois, nearly 100 miles away. The only witness to the crime was a girl named Kathy Sigmund, Maria's best friend. The perpetrator was someone who called himself Johnny. The FBI and later the Illinois State Police launched massive investigations into the case. However, in spite of their best efforts, the case went cold and no suspect was ever arrested. Fifty years later, the case was reopened when a new suspect, Jack McCullough, also known at the time as John Tessier, was identified. After three years of investigation, he was arrested in 2011. He was tried and convicted in September of 2012. The conviction was upheld on appeal in February of 2015. However, a year later, the conviction was vacated and the charges were dismissed in April of 2016. In this presentation, I'm not going to tell the story in the usual way, but I'm going to tell it through the eyes of the investigators when the case was reopened in 2008. After that, I will go through a series of allegations made by the investigators and prosecution and show how they stand up to the actual facts. Now, there's a caveat. I'm basing this story on documents and interviews with the investigators, not on personal knowledge. So some amount of conjecture is involved, and in places I may not have the story quite right. For those who would like to learn more about the case, it has been covered extensively in various forms of media, including numerous newspaper articles, five books, six radio interviews with the authors of those books, four news documentaries, at least 20 YouTube videos, nine podcasts at least, and most importantly, it was an episode on Dr. Phil. Now, one of the unique aspects of this case is that a huge amount of documentation is available, including both the original FBI and Illinois State Police reports, the police reports from the 2000 investigation onwards, and lots of legal filings and transcripts. You almost never get that kind of information in a true crime investigation. Thus, we have all the reports from the original investigation, all of the so-called field notes, which are actually the police reports from the new investigation, the statement of probable cause, which is a document prepared at the time that Jack McCullough was arrested, the Seattle interrogation video, which is a three-hour interrogation of Jack just after he'd been arrested. We also have the transcripts of two grand juries, the trial transcript, and various other court hearings, appellate briefs, court opinions, and finally, the report of Richard Schmack, who is the state's attorney, who is the one who had the conviction overturned. At this point, I'm going to present one slide with more information on what was learned from the first investigation in 1957. I will only give the essential details. Much will be left out for the sake of brevity. On the evening of December 3, 1957, snow was starting to fall in Sycamore, Illinois, and two young girls, Maria Riddolph and Kathy Sigmund, who were best friends, were given permission to go outside after dinner to play. They met up at one of their favorite spots, a big tree on the corner of Center Cross Street and Archie Place. After they had been playing for a while, a man who called himself Johnny walked up, started acting very friendly, and offered piggyback rides. Maria accepted, and Johnny then asked if she had a doll. Maria ran home and returned with a rubber doll. Kathy then said her hands were cold, and she went home to get her mittens. When she returned, Maria and Johnny were gone. The next day, the FBI came to town, and it launched a full investigation. At peak, 60 agents were working the case. The story made national news. Hoover demanded daily reports. Even Eisenhower was briefed. However, the FBI had a serious handicap. There was no useful physical evidence, and the only one who knew what Johnny looked like was Kathy Sigmund. She was eight years old. The FBI turned the town upside down and wrote reports on over 200 suspects, but in the end, no one was charged. Five months later, Maria's body was found almost 100 miles west of Sycamore, outside the small town of Woodbine. Since she had never left the state, the FBI no longer had jurisdiction, and the Illinois State Police took over. It also investigated dozens of suspects, but in the end, it too came up empty, and the case went cold for 50 years. One last thing to note is that a family called the Tessiers lived just over a block north of the scene of the kidnapping. The parents were Ralph and Eileen. 
At the time of this picture, there were four children of whom John was the oldest. By the time of the kidnapping, the family had grown by one more. Now move forward in time to September 11, 2008. One of the Tessier sisters, Janet, sent an email to the Illinois State Police with a message that read, in part, Sycamore, Illinois, December 1957. A seven-year-old child named Maria Riddle vanished. I believe that John Samuel Tessier from Sycamore, Illinois, a.k.a. Jack Daniel McCullough, is responsible for her, for her death. Now, at this point, it is helpful to understand a bit about the Tessier family history. Eileen, the mother, was Irish, and she had previously been married to Samuel Cherry. John was their son, born in Northern Ireland. Samuel was killed early in World War II, and Eileen then married Ralph and moved back to the U.S. John was never adopted by Ralph, so his legal name remained John Cherry, although he used the name Tessier for convenience. John was thus a half-brother to all of his siblings. John would later change his name to Jack Daniel McCullough, the last name being the maiden name of his mother, and I will refer, refer to him as either Tessier or McCullough interchangeably. Finally, there were four sisters who will play a role in the case, Catherine, Jean, Janet, and Mary. Janet's email was forwarded to Tony Rapotz of Zone 1 Investigations, which covered Sycamore. Now, Tony could have just ignored the tip since the case was so old, but two days later, he phoned Janet and heard more of the story. Janet related a story of, uh, from 1994 when her mother was dying of cancer. And according to Janet, when her mother had only two weeks to live, Janet was sitting by her bedside and her mother grabbed her wrist and said, Janet, those two little girls, the one that disappeared, John did it. John did it and you have to tell someone. So Eileen has been carrying this terrible secret with her for all these years and now it's Janet's secret. So finally, 14 years later, she died, decided to do something about it. Now, Tony Rapotz had never heard of the Ridolf kidnapping, so he signed a criminal intelligence analyst, Larry Cott, to provide background information. Larry likely unearthed the story as I presented it on the previous slide. Now, a normal person would probably say, what a terrible tragedy. But a police investigator would note that there were two crime scenes, Sycamore and Woodbine. And if one were investigating a sub suspect, one would try to tie that person to both crime scenes. At this point, Brian Hanley was assigned to the case as the lead agent, and he reopened it on October 2nd, 2008. Note that he gave the time of the incident as being 1800 or 6 o'clock p.m. Not sure where that came from. Regardless, at this time, Tessie had already been tied to Sycamore. Cotton Hanley's first stop was the Sycamore Police Department, where they obtained the case file for the Riddle kidnapping. Larry would later describe this file as being a complete mess. Now, the case file had been assembled by Lieutenant Pat Soler over a period of 15 years in the 1980s and 1990s. Pat had tried to identify a possible suspect by matching details of the case to others that were maintained in a National Violent Offenders database. In 1997, he obtained a possible lead on a suspect, William Henry Redmond, and he wrote a report, now called the Soler Report, detailing why this person might have been the perpetrator, and including in it descriptions of both Johnny and Redmond. It seems likely that Hanley used this report as his initial description of Johnny, including, among other things, that he wore a multicolored sweater. Five days later, Cotton Hanley interviewed Janet Tesse in person. Among other things, they learned that John had been investigated by the FBI back in 1957. Curiously, they also learned that he had enlisted in the Air Force just after the kidnapping. They also learned, probably in response to a leading question by Brian Hanley, that the family would take annual trips out to Apple River in northwest Illinois. And if you look on a map, Apple River State Park is only nine miles away from Woodbine. So this would now appear to tie Tessier to the Woodbine crime scene. Six weeks later, Brian Hanley visited the scene of the crime in Sycamore. And he wrote a short report that didn't have very much in it. But one thing he might have noticed was that there's a street light at Center Cross Street and Archie Place. By January of 2009, Cotton Hanley had received a copy of the Illinois State Police case file from 1958. Now, this copy was re reproduced from microfilm, so it was in various states of legibility. One document that must have captured their attention was a report on a canvas of military recruiting stations in the area around Sycamore undertaken by the Illinois State Police in July of 1958, looking for recruits who had enlisted around the time of the kidnapping. Near the top of the list was John Samuel Cherry, who had enlisted on December 3rd itself. Further, there was a lengthy report on information about him obtained by the Illinois State Police. 
In particular, we were advised by the recruiter that the FBI had checked on the subject. He contacted Assistant State's Attorney Boyle, and he stated that the FBI did considerable work on this man's background, etc. He was apparently alibied through a phone call he made from the Rockford recruiting station asking his father to come to Rockford and pick him up. He had been rejected for medical reasons. So first, this confirmed the information from Janet that Tessier had been investigated by the FBI and enlisted in the military around this time. So this would have raised Janet's credibility in their eyes. It may have involved taking a physical exam since he was rejected for medical reasons. He was leaving town the exact same day as the kidnapping. Surely this raised a red flag. He was a suspect of both the FBI and the Illinois State Police. How can you become a suspect of two law enforcement agencies? That's got to be a double red flag. Finally, Rockford, if you look at a map, is on the way between Sycamore and Woodbine. So if a kidnapper was tra traveling between the two locations, one of the ways to go would be through Rockford. And this must have raised yet another red flag. So everything is consistent with Tessier being the kidnapper. The question then comes, what time was the phone call? If it was at about the right time after the kidnapping, the driving time from Sycamore to Rockford, that would raise yet another red flag. By August of 2009, Hanley had permission to travel out of state, so he and Todd Damaski traveled to Minnesota to interview Catherine Tessier, now Caulfield, the eldest of the sisters and the one with the most knowledge of the family history. Note that she was six years younger than John, so she is 12 at the time of the kidnapping. Hanley and Damaski learned quite a bit of information from Catherine, most of which is not really relevant here. However, they did learn such things as John had owned a multicolored sweater. They also learned that John had owned a car, a 48 Plymouth Coupe, which meant that he actually had the means to drive from Sycamore to Rockford and Woodbine. They learned that Catherine had attended a 4-H meeting in the early evening of December 3rd. They learned an interesting story. According to Catherine, when the FBI came to interview the Tessiers, her mother told the FBI that John had been home all night, but she knew that he had not been home. So it was as if the mother had lied to protect John. Now, she also had no recall of trips to Apple River, and she made no mention of the parents going out and helping with the search that evening. Next. Hanley and Damaski traveled to Louisville, Kentucky to interview the second oldest sister, Jean. She confirmed much of the information that had been provided by Catherine. She also confirmed the story about their mother apparently lying to the FBI, saying that John had come home that night. She also provided new information about how her parents had gone out to help with the search that night and how Jean had had to sleep on the couch to let them back in to the house around 3 or 4 a.m. because they didn't have a key for the front door lock. Further, because she was on guard detail, she knew that John had not come home. Thus again, everything is consistent with Tessier being the kidnapper and driving out to Woodbine. Now, Jean is also the most complex of the sisters. All of them had accused John of sexually abusing one or the other and a neighbor, but Jean is the only one to claim that he had done it to her personally. Now, she also claimed to have been sexually abused by others almost continuously from infancy up through college, so it is difficult to know how much of it is truth. In any case, while these accusations painted a bad picture of her half-brother, ultimately they are only peripherally relevant to the question of whether he was actually the kidnapper. Next up were interviews with high school friends of Tessier. For the first one, David Frederick, the field notes claim that he allegedly saw Tessier's car in Sycamore on December 3rd between 3 and 6 p.m. If true, this would be important since it would tie Tessier to Sycamore on the afternoon of the kidnapping. Thus, Frederick would be a valuable witness at a trial. Another friend, Dennis Twadell, was actually interviewed on three separate occasions. He would eventually say that he remembered Tessier owning a multicolored sweater and that he too had seen Tessier's car in town on December 3rd, although he would later not be asked about that at the trial. Finally, Hanley and Damaski interviewed Janice Edwards, now Swafford, who Tessier had dated for about a year. In an attempt, they were attempting to locate a picture of Tessier from around the time of the kidnapping to be used in a photo array. Amazingly, she was able to locate such, just such a photo from a trip to a nightclub in June of 1957. Even more curious, she found an unused train ticket behind the photo, intended for travel from Rockford to Chicago. It was dated four days prior to the kidnapping. Now, at this point, Cotton Hanley still didn't have a detailed timeline for Tessier's whereabouts on the day of the kidnapping, but the ticket suggested that train travel and Chicago may have been involved. So on the top, we had the picture that Janice Edwards is able to find 
showing herself in Tessier at this nightclub, the uh, Sky Club at the Leland Hotel in Aurora, Illinois, June 1957. And at the bottom is the train ticket, front and back. If you notice on the right-hand picture, it's dated November 29, 1957, good for 30 days. Finally, in June 2010, nearly two years after reopening the case, Cotton Hanley received the FBI files from 1957, which once again had been reproduced from microfilm. The files contained over 2,000 pages, so they cannot be digested easily. We do not know how Cott approached extracting information from the files, but they had been scanned and indexed, so it was possible that he first searched for all references to Tessier. If so, he would have discovered that there were 10 pages of interest, including a detailed timeline that Tessier had told to the FBI. Interestingly, much of the information that they would read in the files would simply co corroborate what Cott and Hanley had already learned. The main new information was that Tessier said that he went into Chicago to the induction center to take a physical, that there was a problem, and that he had traveled from Chicago to Rockford using a ticket they had provided to him at the center. At this point, Cotton Hanley must have decided that since Tessier didn't use the inbound ticket, he probably drove, which would mean that he also drove back to Sycamore, which in turn meant that he could have been the kidnapper and later lied to the FBI. Additionally, Cotton Hanley learned that the phone call had been made at 6.57 p.m., so that at the time of the kidnapping was 6 o'clock p.m., as Hanley had originally written down when he reopened the case, then that matched quite well with the expected travel time from Sycamore to Rockford, and it meant that Tessier had deliberately made the call to establish an alibi. They may also have decided that the reason Tessier had been cleared by the FBI in the first place was because the FBI wasn't yet aware of Woodbine or the significance of Rockford, and it didn't know about the unused train ticket. Now, at some point, they must have realized that there was an apparent problem with their presumed time for the kidnapping and various statements made by witnesses who had been interviewed by the FBI, but resolving these discrepancies may have come later. The reason for wanting Tessier's picture for a photo array was so it could be shown to Kathy Sigmund, the only person who had, knew what Johnny looked like. She is now Kathy Chapman, in her 60s, with kids and grandkids. What were the chances that she would remember his face after 50 plus years? It has been stated that the photo array, shown at the bottom of the slide here, was suggestive in the extreme. Tessier's photo was taken with a flash camera, while the others were high school yearbook photos taken in a studio setting. Suggestive? Yes. In the extreme? I've seen far worse. Hanley and Damaski met with and interviewed Chevin on September 1, 2010. It was their intention to show her the photo array right then, but it must have been apparent that her recall was not the sharpest and she needed time to have her memory refreshed. So Hanley returned eight days later with a substitute for Damaski, and this time presented the photo array and she picked Tessier's picture. At this point, Cotton Hanley must have known for a fact that Tessier was the culprit, so any evidence that indicated otherwise, for example, regarding the timeline of the kidnapping, had to be wrong. A part of Tessier's alibi that he told the FBI was that after returning to Sycamore, he went out on a date with Janice Edwards, his high school girlfriend. Janice was recontacted by Hanley in October 2010, and according to his field notes, she told him that she wasn't allowed out that night and didn't remember seeing Tessier. I will now jump ahead a bit. After McCullough had been arrested, the DeKalb County State's Attorney set up a tip line for people who might be able to provide additional evidence. One of those people was Pam Long, who lived in Sycamore in 1957, and who recounted a scary piggyback ride she had received as a young girl long before Maria had been kidnapped. She said the person who gave her the ride was named Johnny. She also revealed that old man Tessier, John Tessier's step-grandfather, had lived in the house behind her backyard. McCullough was confined to the DeKalb County Jail for over a year after his arrest, and on account of his being an inveterate talker, he told his story to three inmates, and they would later come forward and volunteer to snitch on McCullough, claiming that he had confessed to the crime. Kirk Swaggerty claimed that McCullough had told him that he had accidentally smothered Maria. Christopher Diaz and John Doe instead said McCullough told him that he had pulled Maria into his home through his bedroom window and strangled her with a wire. During the investigation, Jack McCullough was living in Seattle, so when the time came to have him arrested, Hanley and others from the Illinois State Police traveled to Washington State and worked with the Seattle Police Department to have Jack arrested and hailed into the Seattle Police Department headquarters for questioning. The primary Seattle detectives to assist them were Cloyd Steiger and Mike Szynski. 
The interrogation lasted for over two hours and was mainly carried out by David Zalowski and Mike Szynski. Now, Zalowski was from the Chicago area, but was not affiliated with the Illinois State Police. Instead, he ran a consulting company that offered training courses in interviewing and interrogation techniques. He was brought in because McCullough had previously been a policeman, and it was thought that a trained specialist might have a better success at questioning him. After returning to Illinois, he wrote a featured article on his company's website that described the details of the interrogation. McCullough was extradited back to Illinois, and a year later was tried in a bench trial, Judge Halleck presiding, and found guilty. The prosecution team consisted of Clay Campbell, Julie Chavarthen, and Victor S. Garcita for the DeKalb County State's Attorney's Office. And then in October of 2012, Cott, Hanley, and Damaski all received an award for excellence from the Illinois Homicide Investigators Association. And for the record, the short person to the left of Hanley is Hiram Grau, who was the head of the Illinois State Police at the time. So that is the story of how the Illinois State Police conducted its investigation. Any misperceptions in how it actually proceeded are my own. I'm not going to walk through several specific allegations, many of which have been mentioned before, although some are new in detail. After presenting each allegation, I will cite the record as to where it was made, and then I will cite the facts that support or refute it. Citations are given to the discovery file or to other sources as appropriate. Mike Szynski claims that the Illinois State Police and pro prosecutors did a great job. Let's see if that's true. Allegation. Tessier lied to the FBI saying he took the train from Rockford to Chicago using a ticket given to him by the Air Force recruiter. So in the statement of probable cause in the section where it is describing what Tessier told the FBI when he's being interviewed, he claimed that he had been given a train ticket from Rockford to Chicago and that is how he got there. And of course we know that can't be true because the train ticket was never punched and it was never stamped. So the Chicago Tribune wrote an article after McCullough had been arrested it obtained a statement of probable cause and used that part of it as, a, as the basis for its story. David Zalowski featured your article, his story to the FBI that he had taken the train to the city of Chicago using the ticket given to him by the recruiter could not be true. Everybody had a copy of the Tessier report from the FBI. Where did he say how he got into Chicago? He didn't. He never told the FBI how he traveled to Chicago. The assertion that he had done so in the statement of probable cause was a fabrication. So I've decided to give out my own awards. I call it the Good Police Work Award. I'm going to give one each to Brian Hanley, David Zalossi, and Cloyd Steiger, who are the authors of the Statement of Probable Cause. Great job, guys. Allegation. Tessier lied to the FBI saying he took the train from Chicago to Rockford using a ticket given to him by the Air Force recruiter. So Mike Szynski, during the Seattle interrogation, told Jack, this girl, which is Jan Edwards, here gets a train ticket, an unused train ticket that you were supposed to have used and didn't use that night. Charles Rudolph on Dr. Phil was explaining all the different stories that Jack gave about how he got from Chicago to Rockford. And according to Charles, first he said he took the train. Then when they came up with the ticket showing that he did not take the train, and then Charles goes on and explains the other stories that Jack gave. Fact, the train from Chicago to Rockford is the outbound train. The unused train ticket that they have is for the inbound train. It's the wrong ticket. Allegation. During the Seattle interrogation, McCullough told both Zulowski and Szynski that he took the train. The bottom of the slide here shows two pictures. The one at bottom center shows McCullough at the top, Brian Hanley to the right, and David Zulowski to the bottom left. David has the FBI files open and sitting in his lap. At the bottom right, we see McCulloch at the top again, and then Mike Szynski is doing the interrogating here. At the August 2011 grand jury proceedings, Julie Chavarthen asked Brian Hanley, can you summarize for the grand jury what he initially said about where he was on December 3rd of 1957 in this interview? And Brian Hanley said, he said he took the train from Rockford to Chicago. He stated that he took the train from Rockford to Chicago. He said that to both Zalowski and to Szynski. Well, I have a link to the YouTube video of the interrogation at the bottom. I also mark where he's just talking about the train ticket at the 58 minute and the one hour 34 minute marks. Where did he say that he told them that he took the train in? He didn't. He never said it. Brian Hanley is actually in the room listening to Jack talk. Julie Trevarthen watched the entirety of the video and knows or should know what was in it. Good police work, guys. Allegation. 
The fact that the train ticket was unused meant that Tessier actually drove into Chicago and back. So during the grand jury, the grand jurors can actually ask questions of the witnesses. And so one of them asked to Brian Hanley, you were saying they think he drove in? And Hanley replied, well, he didn't take the train in because we have the ticket. And Julie Trevartan chimed in, that's the only other logical way he could have gotten there unless he walked. I don't think he walked to downtown Chicago from Sycamore. Cloyd Steiger at his deposition stated, if he didn't take the train to Chicago without getting there some other way that he hasn't explained, then he didn't take it back. And Larry Cott continued, uh, the ticket was never used, which led us to believe that he drove in. Fact, there are 10 friggin' other ways for Tessier to travel from Sycamore to Chicago that were more logical than either using the train ticket or driving. Now let's backtrack a bit to November 27th, 1957. It's a Wednesday. What happened that day? Tessier turned 18. He's now eligible to join the Air Force. Thursday, November 28th, what happened? It's Thanksgiving. Friday, November 29th. We don't know for a fact, but almost certainly Tessier went to Rockford. He had two destinations. The first was the Air Force recruiting office. He would fill out his paperwork for enlistment, take his aptitude exam, and if he passed, he was given a voucher for a train ticket to go from Rockford into Chicago. So he would go down to the train station and exchange the voucher for the ticket itself. Why didn't he go into Chicago right then and there? Well, he had some more business to take care of. He went to the federal courthouse. Why? He was not yet a U.S. citizen. He'd been born in Northern Ireland. So he has to file his citizenship papers. And once he's done with that, why didn't he go into Chicago now? Because it's too late. The last train is long gone. So the next opportunity to get in is the following Monday. So what does he do between Friday and Monday? Does he hang around Rockford for three days just so he can use the train ticket bright and early Monday morning? Of course not. He goes home to Sycamore. So Monday morning when he's trying to get into Chicago, he's starting from Sycamore. Supposing he wanted to use the train ticket. It would be a 45 minute drive to get to the Rockford train station. And it's in the wrong direction from Chicago. Finally, the train leaves at 5.30 in the morning and what's it do? It comes back practically to Sycamore before it heads into Chicago. He'd be an idiot to use the train ticket. What other ways could he get in there? Well, this map here on the left side of the slide, I show you the locations of nine train stations and one bus terminal, all of which had the following property. They're closer to Sycamore than the train station in Rockford. They're closer to Chicago than the train station in Rockford. And they all offer passenger service to downtown Chicago. The most likely thing he did on the, on the morning of December 2nd is he walked outside, stood 10 feet in front of us, literally 10 feet in front of his house, flagged down the bus to DeKalb, where he had the choice of three trains, or if he didn't like that, a Greyhound bus, all of which go into downtown Chicago. If he took the train, it drops him off four walking blocks north of the induction center. He'd be an idiot to drive in, and probably at this time, he's most likely sold his car anyway. Allegation. Tessier changed his name to Jack McCullough shortly after Maria was kidnapped, implying that he was attempting to hide his identity from law enforcement. So the statement of probable cause describes the following. Shortly after the dis disappearance, Tessier, number one, was accepted by the Air Force. Number two, left Sycamore. Number three, legally changed his name to Jack Daniel McCullough. Number four, transferred to the Army. Number five, was assigned to Fort Lewis. Now, normally when you see things presented in sequence like this, you assume that they're all chronological. David Zulowski actually reversed numbers two and three. Shortly after the abduction of Maria, Johnny Tessier changed his name to Jack Daniel McCullough and left the state of Illinois. Now, there's a website called Web Sleuths, and somebody posted on there, I think that is weird that he changed his name. I wonder if he is trying to hide his way back then. Scott Jacobson, the appellate prosecutor, in his brief, wrote, evidence of flight and the use of an assumed name may be used as proof of consciousness of guilt. Fact, McCullough's legal name when he joined the Air Force is John S. Cherry. On October 21st, 1959, in a cunning attempt to hide his identity, he legally changed his last name from Cherry to Tessier. It's the name he used most of his life. Cherry meant nothing to him. It was in 1994, 37 years after the abduction of Maria Riddle, that he changed his name to Jack McCullough. Great job, guys. Allegation. Both Tessier and Johnny wore a multicolored sweater. 
Pat Soller, in his report on status in 1997, wrote, Unsub, i.e. unknown subject, Johnny, the one who kidnapped Maria, wore a multicolored sweater. When Jean Tessier was interviewed by Brian Hanley, she related that John owned a multicolored sweater that her mother Eileen had knitted. Catherine Caulfield at the grand jury in 2010 was asked, was there any type of clothing that John had that sticks out in your mind? And she replied that her mother had made John a multicolored sweater. Kathy Chapman at trial was asked, do you recall what the man who kidnapped Maria was wearing? And she replied, this man was wearing a sweater with lots of colors in it. And finally, Dennis Trudell, Tessier's old high school friend, was asked by Victor S. Garcita, do you recall what John Tessier would wear in the wintertime? And he replied, sometimes a multicolored sweater. Fact, the FBI reports from 1957 and 1958 never used the word multicolored to describe the sweater. Instead, Kathy Sigmund, when she was asked on de December 4th, the day after the kidnapping, she described it as a thick sweater that had many designs, small in size, colors green, blue, and yellow. So it's the designs on the sweater that have colors, but what about the rest of the sweater? FBI case summary, 1958. She consistently maintains that he was wearing a white sweater. Let me back up. A white sweater with variegated color designs across the chest. It's only designs across the chest that are, have multiple colors. The word multicolored was first introduced by Pat Solar in an article in the Daily Chronicle when he was interviewed in 1994, repeated in the VICAP report on status May of 1997. Now that's what Hanley first saw when he obtained this case file from the Sycamore Police Department. So he likely picked it up there and used it to refresh the memories of all the witnesses, using a word that had first been used 37 years after the kidnapping. Allegation. Tessier lied to the FBI when he said he was picked up after 8 p.m. in Rockford because Ralph was running Catherine to and from a 4-H Christmas party at the same time. Now, we haven't actually covered this part of his alibi before, but what he told the FBI was that as a result of calling his father at about 7 o'clock, his father arrived sometime after 8 o'clock, and they went immediately from Rockford to Sycamore. However, the statement of probable cause quoting Catherine Caulfield says, she said that Ralph, her father, dropped her off at a 4-H meeting in DeKalb at about 7 p.m. and picked her up about an hour later, which would preclude him from driving to Rockford at the time alleged. Likewise, David Zulowski was telling Jack during the interrogation, Ralph's taking Kathy to a 4-H club meeting in DeKalb. By the time he gets back, it's like 8.30, 20 to 9. Police have already been contacted, squad cars all over the place. But you tell the FBI your dad picks you up at 8 o'clock. But he can't because he's running your sister back and forth. Fact, Catherine's trial testimony regarding the time of the 4-H meeting completely contradicted Zulowski and the statement of probable cause. Her trial testimony, there was a 4-H Federation meeting. My dad took me over. It started around 5 and it ended around 7. Judge Zenoff, in her appellate opinion, picked up on this and said that shortly after 7 p.m., Caulfield saw police cars at the corner of Center Cross Street and Archie Place. Shortly after 7 p.m., what happened to 8.30, 20 to 9? That's an hour and a half. You could practically drive a round trip between Sycamore and Rockford in that amount of time. If we look in the record, here's what we find. Nowhere did Catherine say that the meeting started at 7 p.m. or that she was picked up about an hour later. That's a complete fabrication. Additionally, the police are contacted at about 8, 10 p.m. So that means that Catherine could not be returning to Sycamore a little after 7 and seeing squad cars all over the place already. Almost certainly both sets of times are wrong. We don't know the actual start time of the 4-H Christmas party in 1957. However, we do know the start time in 1958. It was 7.30 p.m., same day of the week, Tuesday. Same location, same everything. So we don't know for sure, but it's very possible that when John Tessier called from Rockford, Catherine hadn't even left the house yet. So it's possible that Ralph drove her to the 4-H meeting, then drove to Rockford to pick up John, drove him back, then headed back to the decal to pick up Catherine. He's kind of like a soccer dad, so he's doing a lot of driving this night, but it all fits. Allegation. John's mother lied to the FBI, saying John was home all night in order to protect him. David Zulowski at the Seattle interrogation told Jack, Eileen also told some lies to the FBI. She said you were home all night. At the grand jury in August of 2011, Brian Hanley was asked by Julie Trevarthen, what did he discover during his investigation into his review of the reports, meaning the FBI reports from 1957? 
And according to Brian, in those FER reports, the parents told law enforcement that John was home all night long. They're certain he was in the house and home with them. At the trial, when Catherine was asked, was your mom asked about the defender's whereabouts on the evening of December 3rd? And what did she say? Catherine replied, yes, she was. She said he had been home. Now, during the trial, Jean was also asked a similar question, and she gave a similar answer. Fact, the FBI reports completely contradict David, Brian, Catherine, and Jean. In fact, in the FBI reports, according to Ralph, he stated that his son was in Rockford at the Air Force Recruiting Office on the evening of December 3rd, 1957. He placed a collect call from Rockford to the Tessier home at about 710. Eileen told the FBI practically the same thing. She said her son had been Rockford and that Ralph had gone to Rockford and picked up their son at approximately 8 p.m. that evening after he had made the collect call at about 7.10. Now, I can't give a good police work award to either Catherine or Jean, but they at least get an honorable mention. Allegation. Kathy Chapman's selection of Tessier's picture from the photo array was the first time she had seen Johnny since the night of the kidnapping. At the trial, Kathy Ch testified as follows. From my recollection from seeing that picture, that was the picture of Johnny that I had never seen until that day. Julie Trevartan, in her closing statement, said, Kathy Sigmund waited over 50 years to have the right answer put in front of her. But on September 9th of 2010, this photograph was her answer. This is the face she had been looking for every day since Maria was kidnapped and murdered in 1957. Scott Jacobson, the appellate prosecutor, in his brief stated, Through all of the lineups and show-ups after Maria's disappearance, and through all of the intervening years, defendant was the only person Sigma identified as Maria's kidnapper. Fact. On December 22, 1957, witness Kathy Sigmund viewed a show up at the Dane County Sheriff's Office, Madison, Wisconsin, and identified Thomas Joseph Riverd as the unknown subject of this case. Now, Riverd was a filler in the lineup, and it turned out he had nothing to do with the kidnapping. Now, let's compare the picture of John Tessier that Kathy picked in 2010 with the description that she gave to the FBI back in 1957. Back then, Kathy said that the man took off his hat that he had blonde wavy hair that fell on his face. Can you see a hat? Do you see blonde wavy hair long enough to fall on his face? When he took his hat off and he brushed his hair back with his hand. Eye tooth on upper right side missing. Do you see a missing tooth on his upper right side? And then when she was asked to describe what reminded River of Johnny, she said she noted that his voice and mannerisms were similar. Can you hear his voice? Do you see any mannerisms? And that he pushed his hand through his hair. Do you see a hand being pushed through hair? And set his hat on the back of his head like the unknown subject. Riverd was five foot four, age thirty five. Tessier was five foot eleven, age eighteen. Can you tell Tessier's height from this picture here? This is not the face that she described to the FBI back in nineteen fifty seven. Allegation. A street light at the corner of Center Cross Street and Archie Place enabled Kathy to get a good look at Johnny. At the time that Jean Tessier was interviewed by Brian Hanley, she's writing a memoir, and after the interview, she added a chapter on the Ridolf kidnapping. Now, it's clear that Jean had been briefed at some level because she put in some details that she would never have known about back at the time of the kidnapping. In any case, here's what she wrote. Maria had been last seen standing under a street light with her friend Kathy just after dark. Back to the website Web Sleuths, a poster wrote, a person I know from Sycamore says there was a street light on that corner back then and that it was the only street light on that corner back then, which is why Maria and Kathy were playing there. After Tessier had been arrested, Kathy Chapman was interviewed by the Chicago Tribune and the story there related that when Johnny approached, the girls were playing under a corner street light. At the trial, Charles Riddle testified that the corner was lit up. At the trial, Kathy herself testified the corner had a street light on it. Very dark, very dark, but street lights on the corner of Archie Place and Center Cross. We stood on the street corner with that light shining down. I observed Johnny by standing in that street light. In her appellate court opinion, Judge Zenoff described what are called the Lewis factors, which are what are used to assess the credibility of a single eyewitness identification. And the first of these factors is the witness's opportunity to view the criminal at the time of the crime. And as Judge Zunoff related, Chapman stood with Johnny observing him under the streetlight while Maria went home to get her doll. She had an adequate opportunity to view Johnny, so the first factor weighs in the state's favor. 
Let me emphasize, Judge Zenoff is relying upon the fact that there is a street light on that corner and using it to help uphold the conviction of Jack McCullough for kidnapping and murder. Fact, the street light did not exist. The nearest street light was one block north. How do we know? Sycamore Tribune, December 6, 1957. There is no street light at Santa Cross and Archie Place. The following two items are from the FBI files. Circumstances, it was dark at the time. There was a street light approximately 50 yards north. Case summary, the street light was approximately 150 feet north at the corner of Center Cross Street and Center Avenue. Now, if you stand directly under a street light, yes, you can see what's happening around you. If you're standing 150 feet away, all you can see is the street light. It doesn't cast any measurable amount of illumination around you. How did Kathy Sigmund view Johnny? According to Kathy, she stated there was sufficient light from the headlights of automobiles passing by for her to have seen that man. The street light that Kathy Chapman described during the trial was a figment of her imagination. So where did the street light come from that Brian Hanley saw on that street corner? Well, it turns out that the city council spent more than a month over three different meetings debating whether or not to approve the installation of a street light at Center Cross Street in Archie Place. I have three newspaper articles here from three different newspapers covering the debate. Finally, on January 27, 1958, as reported the next day, installation of a new street light at Center Cross Street in Archie Place, scene of the kidnapping, was approved without mentioning the case. Now, I previously mentioned that Pam Long had called the state's attorney's office after Jack McCullough had been arrested, telling them the story about a scary piggyback ride she had received from someone she had called Johnny long before Maria had been kidnapped. Here she is on the 48 Hours documentary, standing in front of her old house in Sycamore, pointing in the direction that the piggyback ride took place. Now, her house is on a street corner, and she's pointing east along Exchange Street. She said she was playing on the sun porch in the front of her house when Johnny offered her the ride. On the left side of the picture, heading north is Sacramento. It goes past the side of her house, her backyard, and then it reaches another house, which is the home of old man Tessier, John Tessier's step-grandfather. Pam Long was called as a witness at the trial and gave her story. Allegation. Pam Long tied Johnny, who gave her the piggyback ride, to Tessier's grandfather, old man Tessier, whose house was behind her backyard. This comes from Judge Zenos' appellate opinion. Long testified that the last piggyback ride occurred by old man Tessier's house, which was in Long's backyard. Long connected defendant to Maria's disappearance by tying Johnny to defendant's grandfather's house. Fact. Long never testified that the piggyback ride occurred by old man Tessier's house, nor did she tie Johnny to his house either. At the trial, just as she sat on the 48 Hours show, most of the piggyback rides were just in front of her house. Judge Zenoff just made stuff up. Allegation. None of the three jailhouse snitches who testified against McCullough had any deals with the prosecution or the state police. John Doe at the trial was asked by Julie Trevarthen, Sir, has the state's attorney's office offered you anything in return for your testimony here today? Doe replied, nothing. Kirk Swagger was asked a similar question, and he replied, no, ma'am. Judge Halleck, in his decision, spent quite a bit of time discussing the testimony of the snitches and whether they were credible or not. And he stated, as a group, the court is sure from the testimony that the state has not promised anything in exchange for their testimony. And he used this as part of his finding that the testimony of these three witnesses is credible. Clay Campbell confirmed the rules were very clear up front. There was absolutely nothing we were offering in exchange for their testimony. Fact, both Doe and Swaggerty filed civil lawsuits in federal court against the prosecution and the Illinois State Police, demanding that the terms of their deals be enforced and admitting that they were told to lie about them to the trial court. So you can read the civil case numbers and the terms of the deals here. I'm not going to repeat them. However, by his own admission, plaintiff denied that any promises were made in exchange for his testimony. Plaintiff contends that Hanley had admonished him to avoid magic words that could undermine his testimony. Likewise for Swaggerty, Julie Trevarthen said, Remember, if you're asked by McCullough attorneys if you receive the deal for your testimony, you must say no. Allegation. The kidnapping happened between 6 and 6.15 p.m., early enough that Tessia had time to get to Rockford to make the alibi phone call at 6.57 p.m. So when Brian Hanley reopened the case, he put down the time of the incident as 1800, which is 6 p.m. At the grand jury in October 2010, he testified that approximately 6 o'clock after dinner, Maria and Kathy were playing. A man approached them. In the statement of probable cause, 
It was written that Maria and Kathy were last seen playing at about 6 p.m. Kathy became cold and went home to get her mittens. She returned at about 6.15. Maria and Johnny were gone. Larry Cott, when he's interviewed on CNN Newsroom by Don Lemon in 2013, said that, in reality, the disappearance occurred much earlier in the evening, probably closer to between 6 and 6.15. We had the luxury of having all the reports. He's explaining why the FBI mistakenly had the time of the kidnapping much later. Fact, neither the Illinois State Police nor the prosecution has provided any positive evidence from 1957 to support the timeline of 6 o'clock, 6.15 for the kidnapping, and actually contradict it. At his deposition in 2018, Larry Cott provided no evidence that Maria was kidnapped between 6 and 6.15, and in fact, he acknowledged that she was last seen at about 6.15 by the heating and oil person, who was Tom Brady. Now, Cott knows that if Maria's last seen as late as 6.15, then Tessie is going to have to drive awfully fast to get up to Rockford in order to make that alibi phone call at 6.57, which is so central to their theory of the case. So what is it that drives him? Well, adrenaline and then knowing he's got to get up there at a certain time. Why would Tessie think he has to get up there at a certain time, other than to make sure that Larry Cott's case actually works? So Cott has to appeal to a different argument. He says if you look at Jack McCullough's interview in Seattle, he specifically says it's a half-hour drive from Sycamore to Rockford. I'm relying on Jack, who you know you would think is a very trustworthy person. Really? Janet Tessier, the one who started this whole investigation, calls him a pathological liar. And if he's trustworthy, why wouldn't you trust him when he said he's not the one who kidnapped Maria? Finally, why is it that Victor S. Garcia, in his closing argument at the trial, instead of saying that Jack was driving like a bat out of hell to get to Rockford, instead says he took Maria to his house and pulled her through his bedroom window? Larry and Victor, could you please get on the same page? Fact. Substantial evidence supports a later timeline. Here are some examples of the witness statements. Mike Riddle, for example, said he began to watch television about 6.30. He thinks the program was Cheyenne. While he's watching television, Maria came into the living room. This is when Maria came home for her doll. Mrs. Riddle stated that about 6.40 p.m. while she was in her first floor bedroom reading the newspaper, Maria came into the bedroom, again, looking for a doll. Mrs. Sigmund estimated the time that Kathy appeared for her mittens to be approximately 6.50 or 6.55. Mr. Strombum, who lived next door to the Riddles, noted that on his way to work at approximately 6.55 p.m. on that evening, he saw the victim's father calling for the victim. Finally, William Hindenburg, who was the chief of the Sycamore Police Department at the time of the kidnapping, was quoted in a Joliet Police Department report as saying that this happened, i.e. the kidnapping, on last December 3rd at about 6.45 to 7 p.m., the date and time that she was taken from her home. This is the time of the kidnapping established by the FBI. Allegation. McCullough admitted to one of the snitches that he had stabbed Maria. Now, Clay Campbell, in his opening statement at the trial, revealed something that had never been known to the public before, and that is that in a new autopsy, Dr. Crystal Latham had shown that Maria had been stabbed. Mike Szynski, when he's interviewed on CNN Newsroom by Don Lemon, revealed that one of the things I found very interesting was the one snitch that said that Jack told him that he had stabbed the girl. This is huge. It means that Jack knew some information that was only known to the killer. Fact. None of the recorded interviews or trial testimony of the snitches make any mention of Tessier saying that he stabbed the girl. In fact, Julie Trevartan acknowledged just as much when, during her closing argument, she stated, just because he admits to strangling her doesn't mean that he also didn't stab her. Great job, Mike Szynski. Now, there are a number of other allegations that, in the interest of time, I just cannot cover in detail. Irene Lau lied on the witness stand. David Frederick, the one who saw Tessier's car, was never called as a trial witness. Janice Swafford, the one who said that she never saw Tessier on the night of the kidnapping, was never called as a trial witness. Mike Tzizinski made numerous other statements regarding Jack that turned out not to be true. And there are other additional allegations that even don't fit on this slide. Up to now, we've been examining allegations made by the police and the prosecution against McCullough. Let's go the other direction and examine the alleged alibi given by Tessier to the FBI in 1957. Allegation, Tessier took the train from Chicago to Rockford, December 3, 1957. Now, Tessier had gone to the induction center in Chicago to take his physical. He had had a problem with his chest x-ray 
and he was given some paperwork to take back to the recruiting sergeant in Rockford. The prosecution admits that this was the case. He was let out at about noon. So his alibi that he told to the FBI is as follows. He said that he caught a train out at about 5 o'clock p.m. bound for Rockford. He arrived in Rockford at about 6.35. He left the train station, walked directly to the post office, which is where the recruiting office is located. Upon arrival, he found the recruiting office closed. He then went to the front of the post office, found a telephone, and called his parents at about 7 p.m. It might seem impossible to be able to verify the above, given that there was only one witness that Tessier talked about, name unknown, who is likely now dead, and there's no physical evidence. But let's give it a try. So first we need some facts. First, we need the train ticket, the one that supposedly cracked his alibi. It has an important clue, the name of the railroad company. It was the Illinois Central. The Illinois Central Station was located at 815 South Main Street in Rockford. The post office is located at 401 South Main Street. The one fact that we cannot be sure of is the location of the recruiting office. According to Oswald, it was on the third floor. The right side of this slide shows a map of downtown Rockford with the locations of the train station and the post office building marked. The distance between the two is about a third of a mile, and it would take about six and a half minutes to cover that distance, walking at a steady pace. This suggests constructing a timeline of Tessier's actions, starting with the scheduled arrival time of the train and ending with the time of the collect phone call being recorded by the phone company. I put together a table on the left side of the slide with eight such actions, some of which have predictable elapsed times, while others have some uncertainty. For example, the actual arrival time of the train relative to the timetable, the location on the train where Tessie actually sat, and so forth. For the latter, I give a range of possible elapsed times based on my own reasonable estimates. You can make your own if you wish. Summing them up, I estimate that the time of the collect phone call should have been about 12 minutes, give or take four or five, after the scheduled arrival time of the train. It is important to remember something. The time of the collect phone call has to have fallen within this narrow window of time. If it fell outside, Tessier's alibi would be crushed. Now I'm actually going to go through the timeline in reverse order. We've already covered the time of the phone call. It was at 6.57 p.m. Here on top is the FBI record of that information provided by Dan Schaefer, general manager of the Sycamore Ogle Telephone Company. So given the time of the phone call, we would predict that the arrival time of the train would be 12 minutes earlier, which is 6.45 p.m., again, give or take about four or five minutes. The scheduled arrival time of the train turns out to be the most difficult information to track down. If the FBI had looked it up, they didn't make a record of it. In the course of the 2008 investigation, neither the Illinois State Police, the prosecution, the public defender, nor the Seattle Police Department attained a copy either. So, where can you find a copy of the Illinois Central Timetable effective on December 3, 1957? The answer is eBay. So, I've reproduced the relevant section of the timetable here. It turns out there are only two trains that day. The first one, number 11, the Hawkeye, left at 10.40 p.m. It was the overnight train, and it arrived in Rockford after midnight. That doesn't match Tessier's alibi at all. The other train, the only one that he could have taken, was number 13, the Land of Corn. It was scheduled to depart Chicago at 5.15 p.m. and arrive in Rockford at 6.45 p.m. Bingo! Now it turns out that the FBI also wrote down the phone number in Rockford where the phone call was made from, 29297, but they didn't actually look up, up, look up the location. The number today, if it were in service, you would have to add the digits 81596 in front. So the state's attorney, Richard Schmack, issued a subpoena to the current phone operator, AT&T, to find out the location of the telephone when it was in operation. And he received back a printout which showed that the phone was actually located at 401 South Main Street, the post office building, exactly where Tessie had told the FBI he had been over 50 years earlier. Bingo again. Note that we have had no need to rely on Jack as being reliable. If he was a pathological liar, it would have made no difference. The only way that Tessier could have made the phone call at the time that he did was if he was on the train. And if he was on the train, he was miles away from Sycamore at the time of the kidnapping. Clyde Campbell was replaced as state's attorney in 2012 by Richard Schmuck. And in 2016, upon reviewing the evidence, including the FBI files, and realizing that Tessier was in Rockford at the time of the kidnapping, 
and that the Illinois State Police and the prosecution had distorted and misrepresented the record in order to secure McCullough's conviction, Schmock managed to get McCullough's conviction reversed and charges dismissed. In 2017, McCullough was awarded a formal certificate of innocence. At this point, McCullough turned around and sued the Sycamore Police Department, the DeKalb County Attorney's Office, the Illinois State Police, and the Seattle Police Department for his wrongful conviction. After three years, he settled for a little over $4 million in damages. In spite of that, virtually everyone who investigated the case thinks McCullough is guilty. Why is that? I don't know. But it seems that once your mind arrives at a conclusion, it's very difficult to change it. You become convinced of your own correctness, and you ignore any arguments to the contrary. No one ever looked at the report prepared by Schmock detailing why he concluded that McCullough was actually innocent. So how did the investigation go wrong? I can't give a definitive answer. The investigators all still think they got it right, so we are reduced to conjecture. However, it may have started right at the beginning. Hanley wrote, the Illinois State Police in conjunction with the Sycamore Police Department will work to solve the Riddolph case. Given that they only had one suspect, solving the case meant showing that he's the perpetrator. It should be noted that the tip from Janet provided no useful evidence other than just drawing attention to Jack, and Mary's account of what the mom said, while not outright contradictory, was much vaguer. There's no indication of how Eileen knew about it. However, the animosity of the four sisters against Jack certainly must have provided confirmation for Cotton Hanley that they were on the right track. At that point, one can see how the investigation developed. Conjecture and speculation that might implicate Jack as being the perpetrator rose to the level of fact. Red herrings were not recognized as such. For example, the only reason to be in Rockford is to continue out the Woodbine. Hazy statements from witnesses turned into vivid recollections once recorded in field notes. It was okay to bridge the gap because we knew he was guilty anyway. Contradictions were either ignored or countered with tortured rationalizations without realizing it. The goal of the Seattle interrogation was to get McCullough to confess, and the way to do that was to hit Jack with contradictions in the alibi that he told to the FBI in 1957. However, a necessary assumption of that strategy was that McCullough would remember the details of what he had told the FBI in 1957. The fact that he didn't really remember was not factored in, nor even acknowledged as being a possibility, and thus it led to the police to conclude that he was lying. How about the tainting of witnesses? We don't know for sure how much coaching or refreshing of witness memories occurred. All we can do is note certain curiosities, such as that everyone referred to a multicolored sweater, or that both Chapman and Long using the term flip to describe Johnny's hair, a term never used before by anyone. The real tough nut is Kathy's selection of Tessier's picture from the photo array. At this point in the investigation, Hanley had been working the case for nearly two years, yet he was probably aware that up to that point he didn't really have nearly enough evidence to charge McCullough. Thus, getting Kathy to ID's Tessier's photo was crucial, but Hanley would only have one chance to have her do so. Is it possible that Hanley helped Kathy out? We don't know. The session wasn't video recorded. Judge Zanoff's appellate opinion is rife with its own biases and illogic and merits a discussion on its own. Here we can point to, to two instances. For example, in relation to the reliability of Kathy's ID of the photo, Zenoff noted that Kathy had good reason to remember Johnny's face. We agree, but that is not the right question. Rather, did she have the ability to do so? The two are not the same. Second, in comparing Tessier's picture to descriptions given by Kathy and Pam, while Zenoff noted some features that might have generally matched the descriptions of both Kathy and Pam, Zenoff never noted that the photo didn't show the distinctive flip in the hair that both had mentioned. I could go on, but you get the idea. There are a lot of gaps in Zenoff's opinions. So the question is, can we do better? Some have suggested that perhaps we should increase the penalties for fraudulent prosecution, but there are problems there. Prosecutors turn out to have absolute immunity, so you really can't do anything about them. The statute of limitations for prosecuting the state police is only three years. You might want to increase that. However, that might not be sufficiently effective. You would actually like to prevent even reaching this stage. Would better training help? I note that if you start reading journals of crime and law, you find that there's a number of articles having to do with how the police can overlook evidence that might otherwise be used to help convict somebody. But you find far less about how the police might need to pay attention to evidence that might seem to uh, implicate somebody, but in fact is, is actually irrelevant.
Regarding the rules of evidence, there has actually been some progress. For example, when witnesses are shown a photo array, the person doing the showing is not allowed to know who the suspect is that they're trying to implicate. In trials that might result in life imprisonment, snitches must be identified to the defendant at least 30 days in advance. Finally, expert reports relevant to the reliability of eyewitness testimony are now allowed into trials. A real problem in the McCulloch case was that the judge slanted his rulings regarding hearsay evidence heavily towards the prosecution. Hearsay evidence is normally disallowed at trials, basically because it's treated as a form of gossip. But one exception involves a statement against penal interest, meaning that the defendant admitted to something that would expose him to criminal prosecution, so he wouldn't normally say it unless it were true. That is how the testimony of the snitches was allowed in. The theory is that the defendant could always take the witness stand and rebut it. However, there are many reasons why a witness would not want to testify, such that the opportunity to rebut may be superseded by other issues. In McCullough's case, he had been making statements about his alibi in order to counter what was, we now know to be fabrications presented to him at the Seattle interrogation, making him an unreliable witness. Another problem is that the standard of evidence can deteriorate both with the age of a case and over time. The Lewis factors, which we've already mentioned, actually derive from a Supreme Court case Neal versus Biggers. In that case, there was a seven-month gap between the crime and the witness making a photo ID. This length of time was already judged to be excessive, but to counter it, the witness had never made an ID before. Zenoff cited People versus Rogers in Illinois case as precedent, and in that case, the interval was two years, again with no ID in the meantime. But in both cases, there was an in-person lineup and an attempt at an uncourt ID. Further, Zenoff never even raised the question of whether Kathy had previously ID'd someone. In fact, Kathy had completely forgotten that she had ID'd Rivard. Since all of the original investigators were dead, there is no way to verify or refute the accuracy of her statement. All that one could say was that she had never ID'd anyone who turned out to be the actual kidnapper. So when the bar for admission of evidence ought to have been higher than normal, it was instead lower. Zenoff also botched another Lewis factor, the witness's prior description of the suspect. It's supposed to be the description given before the photo ID. Zenoff instead took it to be Kathy's description at the trial after having seen the photo. Of course, there was no one who could testify to what description Kathy had given back in 1957 because they were all dead, and Halleck had thrown out all of the FBI files that contained a record of this information. Finally, as can be discerned from the above, the rules of evidence are not well suited to the prosecution of a cold case that emphasizes a reliance on eyewitness testimony from live witnesses. People's memories, as bad as they are in a normal trial, are highly unreliable after 50 years. Most people who would want to call as witnesses are dead. The new investigators have no connection to the old investigators, none of whom is alive either. I do not think the rules of evidence can be adapted, given that even existing rules don't get followed in the first place. This is why many countries have a statute of limitations, even for murder. The chances of falsely convicting someone are just too high to counter the natural desire to never let someone get away with it. So that's the end of the presentation. I leave you below with two websites and the name of a book. The first website is run by Jack McCullough's son-in-law, Casey Porter, and contains a lot of information on the case. The second website is actually support for the book called A Convenient Man by Dennis Tomlinson and Jeff Doty, available at Amazon. Highly recommended. Thank you for listening.